John Golia. I'm Greg Fife. And I'm Todd Curtis. And we are the Flight Safety Detectives. Between us, we have over a century of aviation accident investigation and safety experience to draw on as we discuss issues that affect all of us. So we are qualified to share our perspectives on accidents and incidents and what can be learned from them for the future. We're proud to say that we have two sponsors that really relate to the topic of aviation safety. The Professional Aviation Maintenance Association, or PAMA, and Avemco Insurance. Later on in the show, we'll tell you how you can get a 5% discount on your insurance just for listening to the show. We don't just dissect the official reports. In every episode, we identify safety issues and take the mystery out of accident investigations. So maybe pilots in their planes can have safer flights ahead. Well, hello, gentlemen. It is another episode of Flight Safety Detectives. Always good to be with you. Um, we're going to share a story of an accident uh, with a lot of lessons to be learned. The NTSB uh, did their usual kind of shallow investigation um, because this was a non fatal. Uh, accident involving a single engine F-33A Bonanza in which the pilot had a problem with at least cylinder temperature in the number two cylinder and then tried to use a <laughs> at least a reconfiguration of the fuel system to try and cool that cylinder and unfortunately put himself into a position where the big fan out front decided it was not going to run on all the fuel he tried to pump in there to cool that number two cylinder. Um, this is one of those stories, Todd and John, where fuel starvation, excess fuel, fuel flooding, or fuel exhaustion, we see this over and over and over and over again with general aviation pilots. And you know, there are a number of different reasons. I mean, running out of gas is just ridiculous in an airplane. I mean, we've been taught since day one how much fuel you put in the airplane, you fly by time, you switch the tanks, you know, and you leave yourself those VFR or IFR minimums as far as fuel is concerned. Fuel starvation, on the other hand, yes, there's a thousand different things that can cause fuel starvation from improper selection of a fuel tank, uh, you're switching to an empty tank versus a full tank. You get the uh, fuel selector in between the two ports so it's not settled in a D10 and you've cut off the fuel. You can have garbage in the tank and it clogs. The, I mean, there's a thousand different things we could talk about. But in this particular instance, it's kind of unique because this pilot has only had this airplane for what, about 38 hours or thereabouts, Todd? About that uh, so amount of time and model. So it's obvious that it's a relatively new airplane to this pilot. And as the report um, indicates, this pilot may have been having this recurring issue with his belief that one of the cylinders on this six-cylinder Continental IO520 was running warmer or hotter than the other cylinders. And that's really what started the chain of events for this pilot to use a technique that uh, after the accident, he basically blamed on the mechanic, yet the NTSB in their report took a statement from the mechanic who said, I never told the pilot to do that. So with that being said, fill in the gaps, Todd, with some of the more, you know, <laughs> interesting details, because I've got questions and I know John has questions and we really need to talk through this. Well, before I get into that, I'd like to thank Flying Magazine because they're the ones who made me aware of this. It was an article that they had on January 31st, 2024 on their website. They got an email talking about it, and the email mentioned an NTSB report. I thought, ooh, perhaps there's some lessons to be learned, and I'm glad we did. Uh, this happened in uh, Arizona. A gentleman was flying his aircraft back to California, and prior to that, he had some time with his mechanic. 
including several test flights after having an annual inspection. And there was a observation that a couple of cylinders were running hot. And the mechanic gave him an interesting suggestion to run the fuel pump at takeoff because there's a placard inside the aircraft. And there is a picture of that in a public document that says, and I quote, auxiliary fuel pump operation, take off and land with auxiliary fuel pump off, except in case of loss of fuel, of loss of fuel pressure rather. This was not that case. This was not a loss of fuel pressure, but an issue with a hot running set of cylinders, the two closest to the firewall, the two furthest back from the propeller. And this was the mechanics recommended action. This is not in the uh, pilot's operating handbook because it specifically said that turning it off is one of the things you would have to do in a normal takeoff. So right off the, from the beginning, we're talking about a non-normal takeoff procedure suggested by the mechanic and executed by the pilot. Now, as Greg and I and John were discussing beforehand, the pilot in command is responsible for all decisions regarding the aircraft. And as Greg pointed out, Pilot in command also has a responsibility to understand how his or her aircraft operates. This is a situation where not only was there handbook information stating how to operate the auxiliary pump, there was a placard in the aircraft. Looking at some of the uh, public docket information, there was a statement by the pilot through his attorney that said he wasn't sure at the time whether it was because the engine wasn't turning the propeller or if he had an engine cut out on him right after takeoff. And Greg, you pointed out something about that statement. Yeah, it's it's crazy because you have, that brings up a lot. Apparently this pilot felt the need to go out and get an attorney, make sure that uh, he was saying something that he didn't think he should be saying. But when you have an attorney who makes the statement on behalf of the pilot that wasn't sure if the propeller was turning um, because the engine, you know, uh, apparently had a problem. I mean, it, this is a direct drive. I mean, the crankshaft and the propeller are one. <laughs> if the prop is turning, the engine is turning. It may not be under power because the prop may be windmilling, but it isn't where you could decouple the prop unless you broke the crankshaft. You decouple the propeller from the crankshaft. <laughs> Simply say that it's just a, it's a direct drive. But you bring up a number of points, and I'm going to start with John. Because John, you know, you have a here you have a mechanic. He has to have some familiarity with the airplane because he just performed an annual on the aircraft. We don't know how many times he's actually performed an annual, whether it's on this specific airplane or Bonanza's in general. But he did go fly with the pilot for whatever reason, some observation of engine uh, temps or fuel flows or whatever. And as uh, as was stated in the NTSB report by the mechanic, he said that the pilot, you know, after they did all of this, he was in a hurry to get the airplane out of Arizona, head back to California. I, I would have followed up on, well, how does that play out in the context? Was there work that was suggested to be done on the airplane before he flew it again? Or was it one of those... I'll deal with it later. I want to get back to California right now. I'll just live with this. Um, and then, you know, listening to, or at least alluding to the fact that it was um, all of the mechanics suggestions that uh, this pilot used the aux pump to apparently take care of this hot cylinder. How, how do you view that suggestion or recommendation by, by the mechanic <laughs> to this pilot? Well, first thing is he he denied ever saying that. Right? And this pilot had been using this procedure on previous flights. So that sort of indicates if the if the airplane's in California, the mechanic is in Arizona, uh, what are they doing? Talking on the telephone? They yeah. he didn't indicate that. So the mechanic's in a different location when way he normally flies his airplane, but he's blaming the mechanic for telling him to put the fuel pump on. So there's a disconnect there. There's also a disconnect with the procedures in the, in the flight handbook uh, right off the bat that he shouldn't be doing this. And it, it sounds more like he's trying to pass the buck off to somebody else trying to get out of the responsibility, hence making comments like that, hence very quickly getting an attorney uh, to be his spokesperson. 
Uh, so this this person, this individual pilot, uh, has some issues that needed to be delved into. Of course, the NTSB doesn't do that. They do the factual investigation, and they determine that they essentially he flooded the airplane uh, by putting the boost pump on. Uh, known problem with that airplane. He obviously in thirty. What you said taught thirty eight hours in the thirty eight hours. Matt make and model, right. Matt airplane. He, he obviously has been flying with his head in the clouds and not <laughs> in the cockpit. And, uh, you know, not every mechanic is the sharpest tool in the shed. But in this case, I would say that there's a lot of uh, gaps in what he says to make it uh, suspect that it may not be truthful. And just, wow. I mean, just what Todd said about the attorney and, and basically writing a letter or the statement on behalf of the pilot you have an attorney who writes ridiculous stuff into an official statement for the ntsb stuff that may not be factually correct you're using the wrong terminology it's evident that the attorney doesn't understand aviation but now i as the investigator start reading that and go well if this is what the pilot told the attorney and the attorney just put it on paper then it's obvious that the pilot doesn't understand aviation either and in this particular instance, I don't care what the mechanic had to say. 91.3 says you as the pilot and commander are responsible for the operation of that airplane. And oh, by the way, the FAA says if there's a placard on the instrument panel that tells you not to do something, you don't do it. There's a number of placards that say this airplane is not certified for flight into no icing. It's not a suggestion. It's not a recommendation. It tells you you don't fly the airplane in the no icing conditions. You have to heed those kinds of warnings and um, and limitations set forth. And I don't care what the, the mechanic may have told him because the mechanic has denied it. It's obvious that the pilot was not very familiar with the basis of why you don't use the aux pump, especially during takeoff and landing for you know pumping additional fuel in there for the purpose of cooling it's obvious that there are operating limitations with the continental with regard to total fuel flow and i mean in my comanche i had an io 540 a lycoming io 540 i always took off because that was the procedure you take off with the aux pump on just in case the fuel uh, the um, uh, engine driven fuel pump failed but the, the fuel that was being pumped into the Lycoming wasn't at a rate that would have caused it to flood. But apparently on the Continental IO520, the use of an aux pump will take it to a point where it will deliver too much fuel. And as you pointed out, Todd, in, in talking about you know, some of the uh, factual information uh, the board found during its uh, subsequent investigation of the engine and the examination, you said that the the uh, the spark plugs were fouled, and it was fouled uh, with evidence that the mixture was overly rich, i.e., it was pumping a lot of gas and it flooded the engine. So you know when you look at issues like that, you know how critical is it for a pilot? Uh, do you think, Todd, you're you're flying? Do you think if there was a placard staring you in the face? And your instructor is sitting there and you go, ah, I don't have to pay attention to that placard. Do you think your flight instructor would just si sit idly by and go, hey, don't worry about it. It's okay. My flight instructor would probably calmly say, Todd, uh, let's go through the engine shutdown procedure and park the airplane and go back and have a conversation. <laughs> That's good. I'm glad to hear that. He's my kind of instructor. But John, you're the mechanic here. I mean, and I've seen this. I don't know how many times these kinds of reports, I've had these kinds of reports with my own airplane because I, I've done engine changes on the airplanes, baffling that are mounted on the engine are a critical cooling item. And I'll guarantee that the majority of pilots flying airplanes out there don't understand the importance of proper baffling under the hood, under the cowling. Because in an air-cooled engine, guess what cools the cylinders? Air. And if you don't have the proper airflow 
around those cylinders, which, oh, by the way, the way the flow <laughs> is directed at those cylinders is done so with baffling. And if you don't have the baffling properly mounted, properly oriented to direct the airflow coming into the front end of uh, into the engine, you're not going to get proper cooling or you may get cooling that is insufficient, like possibly in this case where this pilot thought that the number two cylinder was running hotter than the other ones. It's an isolated cylinder. Well, it could be a fuel problem, maybe with a you know problem with an injector or whatever, but more than likely, it was you know baffling, not directing sufficient airflow over that cylinder to properly cool it. And I, I've seen this, and I'm sure as a mechanic, John, you've seen this, where you pull the cowling off and you see the baffling crushed, or you see tears in the in the baffling, or you know it's mispositioned or it's loose, it's just flopping and it, it's been held in place by the cowling, and you know pilots take it for granted they, because they don't understand the importance of that baffling. I can't tell you how many times that we've had arguments with the pilot, the owner of the airplane because the baffles have, have been beat up so much so that you need to replace them and they get upset uh, because of that. And, you know, with pilot perform maintenance, these cowlings come off, sometimes trying to put uh, cowlings on by yourself can cause some problems. You're not positioning it properly, you're wiggling it around, pushing it into place and you, you're impacting on those baffles that are sticking up because they meant to come in contact with the cowling to direct the airflow. And so you beat them up. And then when you get into a, an annual uh, inspection, the first thing then when we take the cowling off, the, the, the baffles are not where they're supposed to be and they're bent and they're distorted. And sometimes you can't put them back. Sometimes you break, you're breaking the, uh, the structure, not just the seals, the seals are, are okay, but the structure of the baffle has been cracked uh, to the point where you have to replace it. And then the pilots get all mad because they're not cheap. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and, you, you and see it, it is one of, often. Yeah. And it is one of those things where, uh, again, <laughs> like you were talking about, I mean, that's a pressurized system. If you look at it, you've got a lot of ram air coming in the front end and those baffles need to be able to direct that pressurized air in a proper flow. If you have blow by or, you know, big, big areas of leakage, yes, now all of a sudden those two rear cylinders that are buried right next to the firewall and, you know, are blocked by the two cylinders in front of it. And then you have all the accessory equipment around it and everything else. You don't get that proper airflow. Yeah. You're going to have cylinders that run hot and they're going to probably run hotter than they should. They can cause hot spots. And you can have detonation problems. You can you can create a lot of engine damage if those cylinders are running too hot. Um, and that's why it is so critical that pilots understand what baffling is all about and how to look at it. Yeah, you can't take the cowling off every time you do a pre-flight. But when you look in the front end of the engine, <laughs> I've seen people look in. I'm not sure what they're looking at because they don't know what they're looking at. Um, are they looking just to see if there's a bird nest in there or, you know, did there, is there a bunch of bees in there or are they actually looking because the baffling starts right at the front of the engine? Are they looking to see, is that thing crunched, pinched, you know, twisted, bent? I mean, again, you should know what the baffling looks like in a pristine condition with the cowling open to when you look in there, especially with a flashlight, see if at least the baffling looks like it's in the proper place. Todd, have you been taught that with, with your instructors? I've been taught to, uh, of course, when I open the uh, access door to check the oil, I usually check the engine compartment from what I can see with a flashlight or with whatever light I can to see if there's anything out of the ordinary, any oil leakage, anything flopping around. But that's the only access I get to the 172 I, I fly is when I open that access door. Of course, I look into the, the front to make sure the... Uh, there's no obstructions in there and, and and blocking any of the airflow into the aircraft. But beyond that, I don't do anything more complex than that. And, and that was the, you know, this is another one of those learning opportunity type accidents 
where the board never developed any of that. They just went with obvious information. Some of it, I don't know how factual it is. Um, because you got the mechanic saying one thing, you got the pilot saying another thing. Um, again, I would have asked the pilot, what kind of airplane did you fly before this one? If it was, if he was flying behind a Lycoming engine of some sort, well, that whole procedure is a lot different, especially if you use an aux pump and, a, you know, was he properly trained on a continental engine? Did he read the manuals? Not only the flight manual for the airplane and of course the placard in the aircraft, but Continental puts out a whole operating guide. So does Lycoming on how to operate their respective series of engines. Those are good reads. Why? Because the, the engine manufacturer actually produced it. And they're telling you all the little nuances and all the little things about that particular engine that you're not going to find in an AFM or a POH. And that's why it is so critical that a pilot be familiar with his or her aircraft. And if you're jumping between airplanes, no, I mean, look, <laughs> you know, Piper, when they built the Piper Arrow, yeah, it has, you know, a like homing engine in it, except if it's a turbo arrow, that turbo arrow has a continental engine in it. And I'll bet you dollars to donuts. You talk to people who have flown arrows, they don't know that there is a series of continental uh, or a series of Piper arrows that have a continental engine in them. Speaking from my personal experience about learning one's aircraft and learning how to fly, uh, I have all sorts of references I look at, look at the POH and whatnot, but the first reading, second reading, third reading, fourth reading, it might not all sink in. Heck, on the 10th reading, I'm still gaining some knowledge. <laughs> so this is an opportunity for continuous education about your aircraft. Just because you know how to fly it, like driving a car, just because you know how to drive a car doesn't mean you know the rules of the road don't mean you know the things that can go wrong, what you should do. And definitely doesn't mean that you've had the experience of every possible thing that could go wrong. So as much as possible, learn from those who came before you. Now, speaking of which, on this accident, we're, uh, I would say we're uh, beating them about the head about what was done prior to this flight. But I want to point out a couple of things. One, we have quite a bit of information about this flight because the pilot survived. The aircraft was largely intact. There was a very good teardown of it, at least on the surface, a good-looking teardown. And I'd like to read from the, oh, also, we have the public docket, has a lot of things that are not in the report. So if you're following up on this, take some time with the public docket. Yeah. In his narrative of the flight, he said, on takeoff, I rotated, climbed to a safe altitude and turned west at approximately 800 feet AGL. I experienced a total loss of power. I made a soft right turn back towards the approach path for runway 18. As I initiated my turn, the plane stall warning began to sound. I immediately stopped the turn, began looking for a safe place to land the airplane. Given my proximity to the ground and the rate of descent, there was no time to try and restart the engine, the, the airplane. On impact, there was a short skid to the dirt. I was forced to put the plane down hard to avoid running into the trees and going into the ravine. So, one thing that jumped out at me, this person did not try to complete an impossible turn. Yep. They were at 800 feet AGL, which, depending on your situation, could be more than enough. But in his situation, it wasn't. He had a stall warning. He paid attention to that stall warning, made a change of plan, immediately put that plan into effect. At the end of the day, he had a tomorrow to look forward to. So uh, whatever yeah. might have happened beforehand, I'd like to talk about the good things they did on that part of the flight. And, and that's a, a great point, because like you said, he did recognize the performance of the aircraft and the fact that if he kept that turn going, he was probably going to stall spin it. So he immediately rolled the wings and looked for a place dead ahead and put it down. You do that. That's why you have insurance on the airplane. You know, you're going to walk away. You're going to live to see another day and let insurance take care of the mess that you just made. I mean, that's what it's all about. But to try and salvage um, you know, the hardware, if you will, it's, it's killed more pilots than I care to, you know, think about because I've done a lot of those accident investigations. I'm doing three of them right now, where again, how much more do we have to drill into somebody's head that unless you're at a thousand feet in a small general aviation airplane, you shouldn't even think about trying to turn back because people don't understand that the impossible turn or this turn back to the runway is not only is not just 180 degrees. 
it's actually almost 360 degrees because not only do you have to turn 180 degrees, but now you have to turn another 90 degrees to intercept the center line and then turn the opposite 90 degrees to then line up on the center line. And you're doing that without engine power and you're doing it at 500 feet and below, you're not going to make it, not in any way, shape or form. Why? Because you got to push the nose over. You got to maintain best glide speed. And oh, by the way, the ground comes up pretty quick <laughs> when you have to push the nose over. So he did the right thing. And I applaud the fact that he did that. He recognized it and, and safely put the airplane down. Um, one of the uh, things you pointed out is that there is information in the docket. So put, <laughs> pull the docket and look at the engine monitoring data because there are parameters for the exhaust gas temperature and the cylinder head temperature. I looked at them, Todd, you're going to put a graphic in, in uh, this particular series uh, or discussion. But uh, if there was a cylinder head like number two, if that cylinder was running a little hotter than most, it isn't by very much and it didn't look to be a problem. And why he thought it was a problem is that a misunderstanding of, of what the engine monitor is telling him, how he was reading it. Or is it one of those things where he wasn't really schooled on the fact that the two back cylinders are going to run hotter than the two centers and the two forwards and things like that? That's an education that all pilots need to have. And that's why, yeah, you can tell if there's a cooling issue because, yeah, if you got one that's running at 500 degrees and all the other cylinders are running at 300, yeah, okay, that becomes very obvious. But if you have a five to 10 uh, degree spread, again, that may be just flow, airflow going through the cylinder. That may actually be a fuel issue on that particular isolated cylinder, but you really should understand the, you know, your airplane and how that works because this guy used that as the excuse to try and use the aux pump and increase the fuel flow to cool one cylinder. Well, didn't understand the ramifications of dumping all that fuel in because it doesn't it doesn't just go to one cylinder. And the, right. the graphics that you see here are based on one of the files from the public docket. The graphics are very, very crude. They were done very, very quickly on uh, Google Sheets. But the modern aircraft that are out there, some of them have rather detailed engine information that you can look at, download, analyze at your leisure later on. And again, that's one of the great things about the aircraft coming off the line today, those options are there. The thing is, you have to take some time to figure out how much of this information is useful and when to use it. Yeah. You know, that's been a, a big debate in the manufacturing of airplanes is how much information do you give pilots? And today, with the digital technology, we can give a lot of information in the cockpit, but that puts some additional burden on the pilot to understand what that information is telling him. You know, you can get too much information and information that's not understood can lead to bad decisions. So there's, there's a whole piece of like chasing your tail around and around for a pilot to understand it. And I wouldn't expect a pilot with 38 hours in the airplane to understand all the parameters that that engine monitoring system can give him. Um, it, that's a, that's a, a whole training program in itself. And it's, yeah. you don't take that on at the same time. You're just taking on learning how to fly a new piece of equipment. But so. you bring up a good point, John. But there's this thing called, and it's recently been invented, called the Internet. And it seems to be, you know, an interactive encyclopedia. You can go on the Internet. You can go on YouTube and find umpteen number of videos of people who, including the manufacturers, who are providing video information about how to operate a particular piece of equipment, an instrument, a system, an aircraft, you know, best operating practices. There's a bunch of mechanics that talk about, you know, how to fly the airplane, rich a peak, lean a peak, and all of those kinds. There's so much information. These are safety tools that every pilot should utilize. It doesn't take that long. Everybody has an hour. So instead of watching Andy Griffith, well, get on your computer, get on your, on your iPad and pull up an educational video about your airplane, your engine, the systems, whatever, because you're going to learn something. And, you know, with these tools available, there is no excuse. 
You can't hide behind, I didn't know that. It's all out there. And it's for just those a matter of, of looking for it and researching it, either watching it or reading it. And a little bit of an insight on the Andy Griffith comment. For the 98% of our audience who have never seen an Andy Griffith show, I got <laughs> one word for you Wikipedia. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, there's one comment and we need to add to that is you need to know the source of that information on YouTube because there is a lot of bad information. So. I, yes, there is. And you have to use caution. But just by every manufacturer, and you can, I mean, it's vetted out there. You can tell if it's coming from, you know, um, EDM or or Garmin or or Aspen or um, you know uh, any one of the uh, number of other engine manufacturers or airframe manufacturers, you, you can tell who's who's got the good stuff, and um, and again, it's all about using those tools to further your education because. It's not something that we just say in aviation and then blow it off. You're a pilot, but you don't know everything. And having a pilot's license is, as we always hear, is a pilot license, is a license to learn. And you continually have to learn. John, I've been doing this accident investigation work now in my 44th year. I've been flying since I was a kid. I learn something new every single day because of my job. It forces me to go outside that comfort zone. It forces me not to be complacent because I have to take it to the next level. I have to be able to understand it. I have to be able to explain it. And I have to be able to apply it to a specific scenario or accident or whatever. And I mean, that's the challenge, but that's the cool thing about not only my job, but just being a pilot, trying to learn more. And I know, Todd, that's what you're Everybody doing. I mean, you know, you're working hard. That. And that, I think, is a natural uh, segue to the second to last word. Because, you know, I was going to fly today. We had some icing issues going on. We didn't fly. We did a lot of ground work, and a lot of simulator work. And I learned several things. Some of those things I should have learned before I was in the simulator session, but let's not go there. So, yes, no matter how many decades you've been doing this, what Greg said is absolutely correct. And you know, another thanks to... Uh, Flying Magazine. They had their take on this accident report. We had our take on it. Make your own take on it. Go find the same information or find another accident that's of interest to you and read up on it. Read up on that public doc. Come to your own conclusions. Are you going to get answers to all your questions? No. That questioning attitude is one you should keep throughout your career. I love it. I love it. You're gonna have, it's going to be hard to beat that one, John, with our last <laughs> word. Right. Well, I you know, I still see the, the accidents from poor pre-flights, poor pre-planning, right? So, I mean, we got to start with the basics. And if you're going to go flying, do a good session of pre-planning your flight. Make sure you do the weather here, there, and in between, right? When you get out to the airport, do a good pre-flight on your airplane. Learn how to do a good pre-flight on your airplane. And don't do what these guys did or this guy did and take shortcuts trying to nurse a problem along. That's where you get in trouble, right? You, if you got a problem, you got an issue, put it on the ground until it's resolved. Don't take the shortcuts and say, oh, just turn the boost pump on and that'll get your temperature down, get you back to California. Crazy, crazy. He's lucky he didn't die with the decisions he made. And after you get in the air, put that head on a swivel because there's still a lot of airplanes out there and still a lot of people to the green. So... You are, you, you are responsible for your own safety. And please, please fly safely. Thank you for checking out our show. We really value our listeners and subscribers. Our podcast gets ranked by you and how much you like it. So please give us five stars in your podcast platform. We want to keep in contact with you. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and of course, YouTube. You can email the show at flightsafetydetectives at gmail.com. By the way, if you're on YouTube, we're really working on growing the channel, and it helps if you all send in comments. Please do that, and we read all the comments. And be sure to subscribe. Remember, if you're in the market for aviation insurance, 
you can save 5% with Avemco just by mentioning our show. Visit them at www.avemco.com. That's it for this episode of the Flight Safety Detective. Until the next episode, fly safe.